Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. With me today, again, is Dr. Canner, the Assistant State Health Officer with the Louisiana Department of Health. Uh, he will take any questions that, that you might direct to him or any specific uh, questions uh, related to testing and, and other things that, uh, that he might need to answer. Um, I thank you for coming back over to GOSET today as well. Uh, we are here today because I just finished our weekly call with the governors and the vice president and the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Um, a lot of discussion today about nursing homes and testings and, and other protocols related uh, to nursing homes. And also wanted to uh, let you know that I've had a number of phone calls with members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force over the last several days to discuss different things. Um, the vice president himself uh, and I had a long talk on uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Brooks and I had uh, a conversation, and then um, Admiral Gerard and I had another conversation uh, today. So I continue to appreciate uh, their responsiveness, their willingness uh, to um, take calls from me uh, and, and to answer questions and direct resources and, and so forth. I also want to tell you today that we have some numbers that are rather encouraging uh, to report. Uh, we are reporting 644 new cases on 15,702 tests. Uh, that's encouraging. I mean, there was obviously a time when 644 new cases uh, were uh, considered to be a really high number. Um, but, but if you go back over the past several weeks, you know that this represents uh, continued progress. On another positive note, our statewide percent positivity has dropped below 10% to 9.4%. Uh, and, and in fact, um, that's below that 10% threshold. Uh, and so we're no longer uh, red, uh, as, as the White House Coronavirus Task Force and Dr. Berkson have put it for positivity. Uh, we are yellow uh, for positivity. We're below 10%. Obviously, we still need to make uh, significant progress but that is evidence of the progress that we have made. You should know that while we have seen improvements in the cases that we're reporting, we are still red uh, in, in, the, in terms of our cases that are developing uh, every day because we still have a high incidence of COVID, uh, which exceeds 100 for 100,000 in population over the previous week. And in fact, of all the states in the country, we had the fifth highest um, incidence rate for new cases over the past seven days. Sadly, we have 28 new deaths to report, including the first death uh, reported thus far in Cameron Parish. Uh, that is a total of 4,431 deaths. There are 1,204 patients hospitalized today with COVID-19 across the state of Louisiana, uh, which is a drop from yesterday, but a few higher than um, where we were um, just a couple of days ago. Uh, and the good news here is the number of patients in our hospitals with COVID-19 is 25% less than it was two weeks after the most recent change in, in the mitigation and restrictions that, that we've imposed. So uh, two weeks after we went forward with uh, closing bars for on-premises consumption, mandating masks and lowering the um, social gathering size, uh, which is about when you would expect to start seeing positive results. That's when we started seeing hospitalizations uh, decreasing. Those decreases have been um, sustained uh, and relatively modest, but, but over that period of time, uh, we have gotten to right at 1,200. I just mentioned 1,204. We were at 1,600 on July the 27th. That has taken a lot of the strain off of our hospitals that continue to uh, have a lack of capacity in many of them. I, st I think the number that I got today is still 15 hospitals without an ICU bed. We have a number of hospitals without medical surge beds as well. Uh, and of course, the strain also relates to uh, staffing issues. And that's especially true when you have uh, community spread of the disease. You're also going to have doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and others uh, who have COVID and have to uh, stay out of work for some period of time. 
We did see a slight uptick in the number of patients on mechanical ventilators, and the number that we're reporting today is 187. So, as I mentioned, we are seeing modest and sustained improvement in our numbers. Uh, the case growth rate is an indication that we still have a lot of work to do and that everybody has to continue to play their part. Um, the things that we've been asking you to do for quite some time remain absolutely critical if we're going to be successful and continue to drive these numbers down. Um, and, and I do want to point out again that uh, in the first surge, you saw a, an accelerated decline uh, in cases. It happened much faster than it's happening now, and that's because we're, we're leaving open as much of our economy as possible. We're not going back to stay at home. We're not going back to phase one. But, but what we've said is that we believe that if people will practice these things, if you will wear your mask, if you'll stay home when you're sick, if you'll stay six feet separated from people who are not part of your immediate household, uh, if you wash your hands frequently, if you decrease your activity, uh, if you don't go in, into crowds, if, if those things happen, we can get to a transmission rate of less than one um, and, and really drive our numbers down, but it really does take all of us uh, doing those things. Um, and it's especially important that we all do our part because we have K-12 schools uh, opening now across the state, and that's going to continue for the next few weeks. We have uh, young people coming back to college campuses all across the state of Louisiana as well. So this is going to be a lot more movement, a lot more activity, and people coming into contact with one another than we have seen um, on our campuses since March of last year. And so we have to be especially vigilant right now um, that we all do our part and that all of these young people uh, do their part, especially those um, college-age uh, individuals who are moving into dorms, into apartments, and, and going to be uh, resuming uh, their college lives. So the mitigation measures are extremely important. They do work, uh, but they're going to be tested again. I do want you to know that we are closely monitoring uh, school and college reopenings. We're going to be looking for trends and potential problems, trying to make sure that we're identifying those as early as possible, digging into the data to see how reopening affects our numbers, and this is a process that's going to continue and I suspect will be refined uh, throughout the fall. Right now, we have 35 K-12 through uh, school systems that, that are open uh, in Louisiana in one fashion or another. None of them are open uh, entirely for um, education in the classroom um, by all students. Uh, some districts are virtual only, others are hybrid. Uh, where some students, at least on certain days, are receiving instruction online, others are, um, or I should say distance learning, not necessarily online, but much of it will be online, others will be physically present. And without doing that, it would not be possible for the students to achieve the physical distancing that they need to achieve in order to safely uh, resume school for on-site instruction. Uh, as you know, they're also wearing masks and, and uh, washing their hands more frequently uh, and those, those sorts of things. By the end of this week, we expect to have 40 systems uh, that will have resumed uh, educating its students, and, or their students, and then we will have the remainder of districts who will come online uh, between now uh, and the week after Labor Day. The LDH is developing a reporting system for K-12 schools, and we'll be communicating with schools about this uh, in the coming days, and has been working are really hard with um, Superintendent Kate Brumley, Dr. Brumley, uh, to, to make sure that, that we're working together to implement this reporting system. And I know there'll be lots of questions about uh, reporting. We know that many schools already have plans in place. LDH has been working with individual districts and uh, principals, uh, principally through the regional uh, medical directors of the Department of Health. Uh, that said, the schools aren't the only reporting entities that are important to this process. We are encouraging parents uh, to make sure that their kids stay home when they're sick, just like it's important that 
we all stay home when we're sick, whether we're students or whether we're working or, or whatever. That's, that's incredibly important. Um, but the parents should be monitoring their children's symptoms, keep them out of school if, if they're having COVID-type uh, symptoms. Um, and there are many people out there who falsely believe that young people don't get COVID. Uh, that, that is absolutely false. The, the good news is the vast majority of kids won't have a significant or adverse impact because of, of COVID that will remain uh, mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, but they are nevertheless contagious. And that's, that's where we have to monitor this very, very carefully. Um, just to, to prove the point, we've had more than 12,000 cases in Louisiana of people who were 18 and younger. Um, so they do get the disease. And, and uh, while it is relatively rare, uh, there are some very serious cases uh, among children uh, of COVID-19 uh, that require hospitalization. And as you all know from previous reporting, we've had a few uh, young people who've actually died uh, from COVID or from the multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome. Also, I can tell you Dr. Alex Bu and Commissioner Kim Hunter-Reed will be speaking with university presidents tomorrow uh, to further refine their reporting practices as well. Currently, there are 13 higher education campuses that have started up again. Eight more uh, will be uh, opening up again by the end of the week. And I mentioned uh, this about higher education because uh, like elsewhere across the Sun Belt, uh, the post-Memorial Day surge in cases was driven by young people between 18 and 29 years old. These are the young people who are now moving back on the college campuses and into these dorm rooms and into these apartments, and it's really, really important uh, that they understand the role that they played in the surge, to understand that these mitigation measures are important for everyone, um, and, and they are no exception uh, to that. And, and so I want to speak directly to our college students returning to campus. And I know that you've missed your friends. I know that life has not been what you wanted to be for a while, and that's certainly true for the rest of us as well. Uh, and you're eager to uh, see your friends and celebrate a new semester. Um, however, I'm asking you to be very careful in how, when, where uh, you choose to celebrate. And if there's going to be a gathering, a party, whatever you might want to call it, where you have any reason to believe that uh, it will be unsafe um, because people won't be masking or physically distant or maybe it's not going to be outside or whatever, I'm asking you to think twice about going. And if you think twice and decide to go, I'm going to ask you to think a third time uh, and, and not do that. Uh, we really need to be safe, especially if you want uh, this semester to play out the way we all want it to, and that is that school can remain uh, operational without interruption for the entirety of the semester. COVID-19 is still present. It's all over the state of Louisiana. We have significant community spread, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, just last week, we had the fifth most, uh, fifth highest incident rate of COVID cases in the country. And even with better numbers, that remains uh, the case. So we can't be complacent. Um, Dr. Burks uh, mentioned to me yesterday on the phone and again today at the White House Coronavirus Task Force that they're seeing more and more evidence uh, that, that community transmission is being driven uh, in large part by backyard parties, uh, birthday parties, uh, in, or, or whatever kind of gathering uh, individuals are having. Um, and a lot of people think, that, well, if we only invite our relatives, if we only invite our close friends or our neighbors. The problem is the virus doesn't pick and choose. Uh, and so when you bring those people together and you get too close together for too long a period of time and you're not wearing your mask, there is significant transmission and there's growing evidence that that is in fact uh, fueling uh, a lot of the cases that are, that are happening across the country and certainly here in Louisiana. I do want to give an update today also on unemployment benefits, uh, executive order that was signed by President Trump Saturday before last. Uh, as you all know, on Saturday it was announced that Louisiana was uh, in the first handful of states that was uh, selected to participate in this, and I know there will be other states coming online. Our grant application uh, that we submitted through FEMA uh, was approved uh, last Saturday, so we will be um, 
uh, participating in, in the enhanced federal uh, unemployment benefits uh, here in Louisiana. Um, the initial award will be approximately $375 million. Uh, we don't have that funding yet, and this is very different than previous um, unemployment funds. This is funding that's coming out of the disaster uh, relief uh, program that's administered by FEMA. And so FEMA will be sending this money to the, the state of Louisiana. We hope to have it uh, by the end of the week. Uh, next week is when we believe that we will be issuing uh, these checks again. Again, the benefits will be retroactive for those who qualify uh, to uh, August the 1st because the previous round of benefits expired on July the 31st, and this is retroactive uh, to August the 1st. You all recall that we were given uh, two options, uh, like every other state, uh, to receive the $300 in enhanced federal payments. Uh, these are weekly uh, benefits. Um, we chose the, the option number two, uh, where we could count uh, current state benefits uh, as the 25% match for that $300 a week uh, benefit. Quite frankly, the other option was not feasible for us, and I don't think it's gonna to prove to be feasible for the vast majority of states. In Louisiana, option one would have cost us $48 million a week uh, to pay an additional $100 benefit to everyone on unemployment in order to draw down um, that uh, $300 for a total of a $400 uh, supplemental uh, ben benefit. So there's been a lot of back and forth about who will be covered, um, and we are working with FEMA for the funding and the Department of Labor for the guidance. Um, and I can tell you the Workforce uh, Commission received additional guidance yesterday that was, um, uh, I think, uh, some more guidance today, uh, just before lunch, that, that basically clarified uh, what they received yesterday. And unfortunately, not all people who were getting that unemployment or currently getting unemployment in Louisiana will get this additional funding. Um, the good news is uh, about 417,000 unemployed Louisianans will be eligible. Uh, unfortunately, there are about 87,000 uh, workers who are unemployed who are going to have uh, some difficulty uh, with eligibility. Uh, and about 67,000 of those workers earn less than $100 in weekly benefits. And because of the way the Department of Labor is uh, interpreting the executive action signed by the president, those people are not going to be eligible. And then we have about 20,000 workers who initially indicated that their separation from work um, was not related to COVID-19. And, and their continued separation may be, but those individuals are going to have uh, to apply again. Uh, and and we, some of those individuals, and most of those individuals, may actually come back uh, onto the role of, of those who can receive these benefits. So we know this is going to be a burden uh, for those individuals who are not going to be receiving the $300 a weekly benefit. We also know that for individuals who are receiving $600, that $300 is not going to fully substitute that. Um, it is better than, than just the state uh, benefit by itself, however, and so we really do appreciate the president making uh, this available. However, we continue to urge Congress to get together, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and to pass a bill that the president will sign and that will be a permanent fix that will take us through the end of the year as it relates uh, to enhanced unemployment uh, benefits. That's incredibly important that they do that. Um, in addition, uh, the unemployment insurance trust fund itself here in Louisiana that we use to pay the state benefits is down to $210 million. Uh, once the REC, uh, which should happen in September, uh, uh, forecasts that that fund will drop below $100 million, uh, we will likely uh, have to borrow money from the U.S. Treasury uh, in order to uh, ensure the solvency of that fund. Uh, and then at some point subsequent to that, we will have to impose a surcharge on employers to, to make sure that we can pay that loan back. Obviously, the surcharge is something that we don't want to do. Uh, and if Congress passes another round 
of, of funding, much like the CARES Act funding that we received previously, uh, we would hope that there would be a sufficient funding and with the flexibility needed that we could uh, pay that loan back without having to have the employers uh, to do that. And obviously we've asked our congressional delegation uh, to assist uh, with addressing this uh, as well. Uh, you probably have heard about the Secretary of State's emergency uh, plan. Uh, today I did sign an order declaring that an emergency exists in Louisiana in relation to the November uh, and December elections. Uh, I do want to be clear that while I issue that emergency declaration, it does not mean that I approve the specific plan that has been put together uh, by the Secretary of State. And in fact, I do not support his plan. Um, I don't believe that it accommodates all the voters uh, that should be accommodated in this public health emergency so that they don't need to go out and physically um, move to a polling location, whether it's in early voting on or on election day. Uh, so um, I don't believe that that plan goes far enough it doesn't take into account the seriousness of this global pandemic, uh, the health and safety of the voters. It doesn't incorporate CDC guidance on very elementary uh, points uh, that are crucially important. Um, for example, there are no exemptions for people who are at high risk of getting ill from COVID or for those who are in their households caring for them. Um, in fact, there's not even consideration given to those people who've been told to quarantine because they've been a close contact with someone who's been a positively diagnosed as having COVID and they've been told don't leave your house for 14 days they're not eligible to request an absentee ballot um, so it, it I think is woefully inadequate to the task of we do not support it, I do not support it, um, and as a result, uh, that plan will not be carried out for these elections. Uh, and, and any resolution, uh, if we're going to have an emergency plan, will likely have to come from the courts. Uh, and that's unfortunate because, you know, we just had two elections where we had a more robust uh, plan in place. Uh, from my perspective, those elections uh, were conducted appropriately and they afforded an adequate amount of protection to uh, voters who didn't have to choose between uh, their health on the one hand uh, and their right to vote on the other. And with more COVID uh, in Louisiana today than when we came up with a plan for those elections, I'm not at all sure why the Secretary of State decided to move away from those, um, from the approach that he previously took. So I will also tell you that we are now tracking two disturbances in the tropics right now, both of which are moving uh, in, in the Atlantic and moving westward. Um, the first wave has entered the Eastern Caribbean uh, and has a medium possibility, or probability of developing over the next five days. The second is further east in the Atlantic and has a high probability of formation over the next five days. It is still too soon uh, to say whether these systems will have any impact on our, on our region. So we're going to continue to monitor them uh, as it is possible that they could enter the Gulf of Mexico as early as next week. We do know that uh, August is typically around the peak of hurricane season. It's August and September. We're now halfway through August and, and the, the water has had plenty of time to heat up and that fuels the energy that these storms feed off of uh, so that they can rapidly intensify and become uh, quite strong. Uh, so I'm asking everyone to monitor uh, the situation of the weather uh, and if you haven't done so, make sure you get a game plan. Uh, so go to getagameplan.org. Uh, and please remember that, that your game plan from previous years uh, wasn't developed uh, with a COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and so there are other things that you need to be paying attention to right now. So please, if you haven't done yet, uh, so yet this year, go to getagameplan.org to make sure that you and your family are prepared in case of a storm. So with that, I'm going to take a sip and then I will take your questions.
Melinda. <laughs> Well, because he would have to withdraw that plan and submit a new plan that would meet with my approval and the legislature's approval in order for it to be implemented. Um, it would be my hope that he could do that and would do that, uh, but he and I had a discussion, that he being uh, Secretary of State uh, Ordwan, he and I had a discussion last week. I indicated to him then that I couldn't support his proposal, so he did not uh, change it. Uh, so I assume that he will not, uh, and therefore uh, either we are going to have no election procedures in place that are uh, driven by the emergency, meaning we just go back to what the statutory scheme normally provides for, or if there's going to be an emergency um, procedures in place that, that it appears to me is going to come from the court. I would always welcome the opportunity to work uh, with the Secretary of State and with legislative leadership uh, to implement a, a plan that actually is responsive to the public health emergency. Again, this one doesn't even allow people who have been told to quarantine to request an absentee ballot. It doesn't account for those who are vulnerable um, to the disease because they might have hypertension or diabetes or kidney disease or heart disease. Um, uh, so it just, it's just inadequate to the task. Um, and. You know, I, I just I have a hard time understanding how today when there's more COVID in Louisiana than there was when we formulated the first plan, that the plan uh, that, that we present uh, to me and to the legislature would actually be less robust and wouldn't protect uh, those individuals. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Some university is one of the few schools in the state that are reporting student cases and getting that information published on their website. Do you think other universities should follow suit? Yeah, it, for the, the question has to do with, uh, with uh, universities uh, making available on a public facing uh, dashboard, a website, uh, the situation on campus with students related to COVID 19 in terms of cases and so forth. Um, we do believe that there needs to be um, accurate data uh, that is made public uh, by the universities. It's one of the things that we're going to be working with, and I think I mentioned it earlier uh, today that Dr. B.U. Uh, is going to be with uh, Commissioner Kim Hunter-Reed, the Commissioner of Higher Education. They're going to be speaking to all of higher education in Louisiana tomorrow about just that, uh, because we want people to have confidence in what we're doing. Uh, and what we know is that if you are not sharing data um, quickly uh, and transparently, that that undermines confidence. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we do think that that should happen, and we're working to, to facilitate that. Any? Yes, ma'am. Melinda, that, that is a great question. So we have the, uh, the, the question dealt with, with, with the uh, current proclamation ending at the end of next week, um, that in the next several days we're going to have to have a meeting um, with uh, the groups here, the, the agencies that are represented here at GOSEP at UCG and driven principally by uh, the Department of Health uh, and the Office of Public Health. Uh, to, to figure out what the proclamation looks like um, on next Friday um, be, because we obviously have to make a decision. We will look at the same gating criteria that the White House made part of the Reopening America plan. Uh, I think that guidance came out on April the 16th. It has not been uh, changed, and so those are the things that we're going to look at. Where are we as it relates to COVID-like symptoms? Uh, but also cases, both the raw number of cases and, and the percentage of, of uh, test results that yield a uh, positive uh, 
uh, case, the, the test positivity, uh, we'll also looking, be looking at hospitalizations and, and the ability to deliver uh, care in our hospitals without uh, resorting to crisis care. Those are the same things that we've been looking at uh, throughout. Uh, it is further complicated this time by the fact that this decision comes um, right in the middle of when K-12 schools and higher education institutions are resuming um, their operations and bringing more people into contact uh, than we've had uh, since uh, early March of last year. Um, and, and it's further complicated even beyond that because we know that over the last couple of months it's been people who are in the 18 to 29 year old range that have really driven the numbers up in Louisiana uh, and, and elsewhere across the Sun Belt and really across the country. So that's not unique to Louisiana. But those are the individuals who are coming together on our college campuses uh, now. Uh, so so we, will, we will have an answer for you uh, about a week from now as to what, what we're going to do. Um, but, but those are all things that we're going to be considering, and I know, Melinda, you didn't expect a, a real answer today. <laughs> <laughs> Sam? Uh, Governor, to clarify, on the unemployment, are all workers who earn less than $100 in state benefits, they don't qualify for the extra $300? And can you also say what uh, specific day these payments are going to start going up? No, I, I, the second question I can answer first. We, we can't say what day the payments will start going out. We don't yet have the money. We believe we will have funding, the first tranche of funding uh, from FEMA by the end of this week, uh, but it's not here yet, and so I can't say with a, you know, a date certain. But we do know that there are some changes to our system that are being made right now by our vendor uh, to make sure that we can process uh, uh, this uh, round of, of payments and then have those payments made. Uh, what, what I can tell you is we believe that we will have the first round of funding from FEMA by the end of this week and that at some point next week the checks will, will start going out. Um, and, and I hope to have more information for you on, on Thursday. Um, this most recent guidance from the Department of Labor came out last night and, and it was actually finalized today uh, just before lunch and I was meeting with um, Secretary Ava Dashwell of the Workforce Commission just before I came in here. And the first part of your question about the 67,000 or so, yeah, the, the reason that they are ineligible under the President's executive action is because of the way the U.S. Department of Labor is interpreting the actual language um, that, that requires a 25% match uh, from, the, from the state uh, in, for any of these individuals. And because their payments are not $100 per month, uh, in state benefits that they're not going to qualify for the $300 enhanced benefit. I guess I'm wondering, because I think last week you said there were about 100,000 of those. Yeah. Um, was that just an inaccurate uh, estimate? No, well, it, it could have been an inaccurate estimate. That was the number that I was given just before walking into that briefing. I actually don't, don't believe that it was inaccurate. I think it was based on the guidance that they had received just before I gave that to you. That guidance has actually changed uh, over, over time. Uh, it's changed two or three times in the last week. Uh, but we do believe the guidance is final now and that what I'm telling you is, is, is the situation uh, that we're going to experience in Louisiana and elsewhere around the country. Um, I'm, I can't tell you that there won't be any states who, who uh, choose option one. I'm not aware of any just because of the exorbitant cost. Um, and so the fact that we have workers who are being left out of this um, then that just underscores the need for Congress to take action. And the other thing is, even if every worker were getting unemployment benefits uh, at an enhanced level from the federal government, we know that the amount of funding that's being made available out of the, the disaster relief fund uh, is only going to fund these benefits for, for about six weeks or so. Uh, so it is still incumbent upon Congress to act regardless, uh, and we really need that to happen sooner uh, than later. And, and by the way, the sooner they act, the better, because if, if they acted uh, and made these benefits available, uh, then, then we can get back uh, to paying everyone, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be limited uh, in, in terms of not being able to pay the 67,000 or so workers. 
So yes, are there any workers making less than $100 on their state benefit who will get the additional 300 or is it all 60,000, 67,000 making less than 100? They're all 60, all 67,000 I'm talking about are getting less than $100 of state benefit per week right now. Yes, sir. Governor, when you came out here, you happened uh, to mention on your call with the task force, Dr. Burks and the vice president about nursing homes. Um, you know, recently in the past couple of weeks, we've had a lot of viewers start reaching out, just asking they haven't seen their loved ones in nursing homes in several months. Um, is there a process now as congregate settings has somewhat gotten under control of maybe allowing visitations or how that will play out getting back to some kind of visitation, whether there's a screening process beforehand or do you have any kind of thought process to how getting back to nursing home visitations? Uh, it's a great question. It's, it's something that was actually discussed uh, at some length today during the UCG call that, that we had um, here at the state level and then again on the, the video telephone conference the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Um, the, the challenge everywhere, but particularly here in Louisiana where we remain number one in the nation uh, in cases per capita, is that the, the nursing home residents don't pose a threat to the community, but members of the community pose a threat to the nursing home residents. And where you have a high incidence of COVID-19 in the community, which is what we have across Louisiana, uh, then inevitably that COVID-19 finds its way into the nursing home primarily through staff who are asymptomatic. And so the way we try to make our nursing homes safer to do several things is one is 100% testing of residents and of staff. Uh, and we've been doing that uh, for some time now. And it's, it is helping us to stabilize those numbers. We were encouraged today to increase testing frequency for staff to twice a week. We're, we're doing it once a week now, and, and that, that is very costly uh, but one of the ways that this can happen uh, is with point of care testing that is available at the nursing home itself. Now, Dr. Uh, Gerard, Admiral Gerard, uh, who's head of testing, briefed today, uh, and this is not a new initiative, but, but it's, it's just uh, further down the road, uh, that by the end of this week, uh, there will be approximately, as I recall, 3,500 or so point of care testing devices uh, shipped to directly to nursing homes, so they will have the ability to to test someone relatively inexpensively, get a result back in about 15 minutes, uh, and we, they want us to use that on on staff uh, staff members primarily and get up to testing um, twice a week. Uh, and in Louisiana, uh, I can tell you, uh, based on the information I got a while ago, we've received exactly nine of those, seven to nursing homes two to uh, war veterans homes, but we've got nine of those point of care testing machines. But within the next month or so, there should be um, machines like this received uh, by a much larger number of nursing homes here in Louisiana and around the country. And one of the things that the vice president mentioned and others is that nursing homes, once they receive these point of care uh, devices, they can then, on a, on a limited basis, schedule visitation with loved ones, and they, they will have to administer the test uh, to the family member or to the visitor, make sure that they are in fact negative, and then hopefully uh, be able to allow a visit to occur. Um, and, and obviously that's something that we want to see as well. Uh, but I, I can tell you that, that uh, the visitation policies are still gonna have to be relatively strict because of the amount of of community spread that we have with COVID-19. Uh, um, and it's gonna be some time before these point of care tests are available. So between now and then, and we hope it comes as soon as possible that people can start uh, visiting again. And, and, and you know, we've always allowed visitation for end of life um, uh, situations. But until that can happen more frequently, we're encouraging people to visit by phone, visit by Facebook, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, FaceTime, uh, and, and other ways uh, that can be done safely because we know that individuals in the nursing home really want to, to see and talk to, to their loved ones. But it, it is a great question. It's something we talked about a lot today. Yes, sir. So then the SEC released their safety guidelines and plan protocols when it comes to proceeding if they have to be in accordance with COVID-19 guidelines. With the way that we are trending, what do you think the fall looks like? Yeah. 
Uh, I don't yet have an answer as to what um, game day is going to look like in Louisiana. I understand LSU's first home game is, I believe, the 26th of September. Um, and I'm not, I, I know we have other, um, uh, I believe we have other teams that are planning to play. Uh, for example, uh, I think maybe Tech, ULL, ULM. Uh, I haven't seen a proposal from any of them yet. Uh, I certainly haven't approved anything, and so I don't know what that's, what that's going to look like. But I know they're going to be very thoughtful. Um, they're going to take the public health uh, and safety uh, into mind foremost and figure out what game day activities need to look like. And by the way, it will be reflected in the percentage of people that can be in the stadium and how they're spaced out and, and so forth. But, but it is, it's a lot more than that. It's how do you get those individuals through the gate and to their seats? Uh, and then how do you run concessions? How do you run uh, restrooms? How do you get them out at the end of the day? What do game, activity, game day activities look like before the game? Um, are they going to allow people on campus who don't have a ticket to the game, for example? Uh, to what degree are they, and, and in what locations? Uh, and under what restrictions are they going to allow tailgating? And, and before the game and after the game. So there are a lot of things that, that really have to be worked out. Uh, they will be making proposals soon, and, and I think you're going to have uh, an answer uh, sooner than later because it takes some time. You can't decide on the 25th of September what the game day is going to look like on the 26th. So I expect that sometime this week we're going to find out when uh, LSU needs to have a plan in place uh, in order to be able to execute that game on, on the, the 26th. Uh, but I, I just don't have information for you today as what that's going to look like. Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is convention week. Uh, you're among prominent Democrats to sign a letter criticizing the Democratic Party's stance on abortion rights. Um, what do you say to critics who say you're creating division within the party at a time when they need unity to win uh, a election? I would say that you need unity across a broad spectrum of, of individuals and and thoughts, and, and that uh, the Big Ten is the best way to win. Um, look, uh, it's no secret that, that I'm out of step with the National Party and, and on this issue. Uh, I'm certainly not out of step here with the vast majority of Louisianans, and I will tell you uh, that as best I can discern uh, from a, a big portion of Democrats in Louisiana. Um, and so I did not sign on to the party platform because of that particular provision. And I just expressed a concern about it and, and asked that the, the platform committee uh, move back to a previous version of the platform that, that uh, was uh, more consistent with, with my views on the issue of abortion. Um, so so I, I believe we win with a big tent uh, and, and the, the bigger the better and that we should make people feel comfortable um, being Democrat. All right, so we will have our next briefing on Thursday. Uh, we'll, we'll schedule that back for 2.30, and uh, we're anticipating having that back over at the Capitol. Uh, so we, we will see all of you then, and uh, thank you very much for continuing to cover this. And I do just want to wrap up by, again, stating we are doing better. We've seen modest improvement over the last couple of weeks. But we still have the fifth highest growth rate of cases in the country over the past seven days. Uh, while our positivity numbers are better and, and, and fell below 10% for the first time in a long time, we are still yellow there. And there are many, many, many states whose, whose positivity is much lower than Louisiana's. So we still have work to do. And I'm asking everybody to play their part. Uh, wear your mask, social distance, uh, make sure you stay home when you're sick, wash your hands frequently, cut down on your activity. Um, and if we will all do this, we're going to continue to make progress, uh, and we can do it without going back to a stay-at-home order or to phase one. And it is especially important that we are vigilant right now because we have schools opening K-12 and higher education where, where many young people are going to be coming together uh, in, a, in a way that they haven't since March of, of last year. Uh, and, and so we need to be uh, very, very careful about how we, we do things. And, and I know the people of Louisiana will do that. Um, and we're going to ultimately be uh, successful.
and I do encourage everyone, obviously, uh, to make sure that uh, that they're not just working for these results, but they're actually praying for them as well. And I'll see you all on Tuesday, I'm sorry, on Thursday at 2.30.